here with Waterlogged. And for the last few videos, we've been talking about fish foods and how to make different kinds of foods. But today, I thought it would be important that we talk about fish nutrition, right? So what are some of the basic requirements that our fish need? There's a lot of information out there, but I have a really great source, and that is Dr. Jessie Sanders. Now, she is the chief veterinarian and the owner of her practice, Aquatic Veterinary Services, that's based out of California. So please join me in welcome, welcoming Dr. Sanders. How are you today? I'm doing great, Hillary. How are you? I'm pretty good. I'm excited to have you here to tell us about fish nutrition. Yes, thank you so much for the opportunity. I love doing presentations like this and nutrition is one of my favorite topics. So it's always good to see what's out there and new and research. We can share it with everybody else. I like it, I like it. I've been a fan of yours for years and I know you've got some great information. So I'm happy for us to be able to share it with more people. Yes, me too. All right. So we will be talking today about fish nutrition basics. We'll start out with a little bit about fish metabolism, go through different life strategies, cover some of the nutritional requirements, and end with some general guidelines. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to put out the little caveat that we are trying to basically take 30,000 different fish species and condense them down. Now, again, most of what we're going to be dealing, dealing with is pet fish, but we still have about a thousand species to deal with. So again, these are general guidelines. We're going to do the best we can and just work with what we got. Yep. I like it. So starting out with fish metabolism. Most fish are ectotherms, and this means they cannot utilize their cellular energy to warm their body. So humans like us, we maintain about the same body temperature no matter where we are. We go a little bit too cold, a little bit too warm, we're going to die. So <laughs> unfortunately, we just can't do anything about maintaining our own body temperature if we were a fish. Now, there are some open ocean fishes that are actually able to do what humans do, but they mostly do this through lots of vigorous swimming, which if you're in a fish in a tank, not, not really going to be the case. Although we, we don't know, there might be something that we don't know about. <laughs> Most fish metabolism is going to be tied to the water temperature. And depending on your fish's species and where they kind of call home is going to give you two different ranges. So most marine and freshwater tropical fish have very narrow temperature ranges. So they're going to require consistent temperatures and therefore maintain a consistent metabolism. Now, those fish that like to live in outdoor ponds, like koi and goldfish, they can tolerate a very wide temperature range. So their metabolism is going to change based on what the water temperature is doing. And this is going to change throughout the day, seasonally, sometimes, you know, pretty much from 32 just before freezing up until those 80 degrees Fahrenheit, about 29 degrees Celsius. They can pretty much just keep churning things out just at a different rate. <laughs> So looking at some different life strategies. So starting out with carnivores. These are our meat eaters that we have our little piranha there. They have an increased requirement for animal-based proteins. And a lot of these species, what we have, what we call a true stomach. So like we do, we have a little outpouching between the esophagus and the intestines that has acid that breaks down protein. Now, not all fish that are carnivores have this, but most of them do. And then we have the herbivores or the plant eaters. So these have an increased requirement for plant-based proteins. And if you think about these guys in relation to a horse or a cow, they have very, very long intestinal tracts that are going to be kind of milking everything out of it. So if you ever do a necropsy on a fish, you can probably tell what their diet is based on how long their intestines are. Very, very short, usually going to have that acidic stomach at the front, is going to be mostly carnivorous. Very, very long, gonna look at the herb herbivorous. Now, a lot of pet fish fall in the omnivore category, which means you're not really a true herbivore, you're not really a true carnivore, you're somewhere in between, and you're gonna slide up and down that scale, a little bit more herbivorous, a little bit omnivorous. You really can't tell sometimes. So a good example of this is a common carp. So this is the way back descendant of the koi. Uh, they basically eat pretty much anything they can get their little mouths on. Um, they like eating invertebrates. They like eating tiny fish. They like eating plant material, bugs, you name it, they'll eat it. So most fish, especially the, those with consistent metabolisms, are going to be grazing a little bit throughout the day. Again, when you're in the wild, you don't know when your next meal's coming. So you got to eat it while you can. 
Now, it's been shown that some fish that have been bred in captivity over many generations start to figure out that, okay, a new a meal is coming, so I can just kind of cruise around for a little bit. I don't have to worry about eating all the time. But again, this depends on, you know, what environment they're put in, how much competition there is for food. So it's going to vary even if, you know, they've been bred in captivity and, you know, the little dinner bell goes off and they all just run for the food. <laughs> So most fish's metabolism is going to be constantly on and how fast it moves again is going to be temperature dependent. Not many pet fish species have a stomach that they can like hold on to meals. They might have like a little tiny thickening or outpouching of the distal esophagus and the proximal intestine. Most of the time it just keeps on moving. So, you know, they can't really have that full sensation. They're pretty much always going to be hungry. Okay. The only one we have that really has a true stomach is a lot of carnivores like this trout. So again, open them up. They're going to be eating bigger meals throughout the day. They can kind of process those and then go back for another one. Again, all temperature dependent. If your fish has to go a long wait between meals. So let's just say it's a marine fish. You get fed maybe once in the brief morning, once in the evening. During the day, the metabolism is still going to be cranking out. And as the food moves to the intestine, just like ours, it gets covered in a protein um, kind of mucus that helps slide things out the other end. And if there's no food in that tube, you're just going to see a mucus string coming out of your fish. And a lot of newbies freak out and think that this is a parasite. <laughs> but if you look, it's the most researched thing that our website comes across is a white stringy poop. And it's really just an empty fecal cast with nothing in it. So it means either your fish just hasn't eaten for a while. I mean, that might be a couple days. Certainly that would be something to concern about. Um, but if, you know, it's a warm fish and you fed them several hours ago, it's probably normal, but definitely not a parasite. <laughs> now I've got a question. I'm going to interrupt you here. So one of the things that I know that there can be discrepancy between like aquarists is how often to feed your fish. I've talked to some people that feed their fish like two and three, four times a day even. And then I also know people that, you know, don't feed every day or maybe feed like every third day or something. What would you recommend is the average to feed for your average fish? I know there's a yes. lot of different things that are out there. <laughs> yeah. So again, it's going to be temperature dependent. So a lot of the marine and tropical fish at least twice a day is really what's recommended. Certainly you can break that up and do multiple small meals per day. Again, these guys are used to grazing. So they'll be more than happy to keep nibbling a little bit throughout the day. For, you know, tanks that aren't heated, they're outside and really cold, um, maybe once a day, if it's gotten really cold every other day. Um, a lot of fish are better than humans at knowing when they're hungry or not. So <laughs> sometimes your fish like looks at the food, swims away, you know, day or two, not really a big deal. Um, but yeah, again, it's going to depend on the temperature. So those tropical marine tanks should probably be fed at least twice a day. You know, if it's twice one day, once every other day, that's fine. But again, they're used to kind of nibbling a little bit. So as long as they're getting enough protein for that, you know, general requirement, again, we don't mm -hmm. know what that is, but we do our best guess. Um, it's best to kind of keep their metabolism, again, just crunching on a little bit as much as you can. All right. Good to know. Moving on to fish nutritional requirements. So... Unfortunately, the research for most pet species is pretty much non-existent. Pretty much everything that is in research that has been actually performed and tested is extrapolated from aquaculture. Hmm. So as you can imagine, aquaculture species, cute little pet marine species, not really a ton in common. Um, so we do our best. So obviously everything that we're talking today, I could be saying something completely different a year from now. Nutritional requirements are going to vary by life stage, species, and reproductive status. So young fish, especially true fry, that, you know, when you have a little baby fish, they have a little yolk sac there. Oh. As soon as they burn through that, they still need lots of fats and proteins that those adults really don't need. And if you have a female that's, you know, making lots of babies, obviously she's going to need more food. And some species just like to have more calories just the way they're built, just the way it goes. So the different components we're gonna be looking at are calories, protein, 
fat, carbohydrates, and vitamins and minerals. So starting off with calories, this is pretty much on all human foods. It's on most cats and dogs foods. And essentially this is the metabolic energy return from your diet. However, it is not available or even known for most fish species. I have never seen a bag of fish food that lists it by calories. Um, it's not required. So unfortunately, if you were actually able to figure that out, this would be the definite answer on what exactly, how much to feed your fish per day. All right, so if you're watching this video and if, you, if you're looking for a research project, <laughs> keep that in mind. Exactly. If you wanna do it in at least one species and then a thousand people do that, we'll be a little bit better than where we need to be. <laughs> so move on to protein. So in nutrition, there are 10 essential amino acids which are essentially proteins that fish cannot synthesize themselves. It's the same for humans, cats, dogs, horse, sheep, goats. There are many other non-essential protein sources that, you know, some different species can make themselves using other proteins, but mostly we're gonna focus on those 10 essential amino acids. Protein is essential for fish who are constantly swimming. So like the little guys that are behind you kind of darting back and forth, Obviously, they're going to need more protein than the guys that just kind of sit on the bottom or those lovely little beta fish that just kind of hang out all the time. And that's fine. Protein is going to be lower for herbivores and higher for carnivores. Um, this basically just around the principle that animal-based protein sources tend to be more complete. So complete means is they have a higher ratio of those essential amino acids. And that's basically all complete really means. Now, when it comes to amino acids, I know that there's products that are out there on the market that are amino acids. Would you recommend just, just in case soaking your fish's food in some of those amino acids or will it make a difference? So all diets that are put on the commercial market have to have those 10 essential amino acids. So you can add a little bit more. You really don't have to. They're required to be a complete diet in order to have all those, um, depending on where they get them is gonna vary, but you don't have to add more. Um, certainly if it makes you feel better, it's not gonna hurt the fish, um, but you don't have to add them, no. Okay, good to know. Yeah. So moving on to fat. So fat is essential for reproduction and hormone production. So this is for stress, for metabolism, for making sure your body's doing what it's supposed to do. Fat is essential for juvenile and reproductively active fishes. More mature fish, not so much. They're pretty much all put together. They just need a little bit for hormone production. And really the fat you have to uh, supply those essential fatty acids. So those omega fatty acids that actually we eat, you know, from yep. the fish, they can't produce those themselves most of the time. So they have to go out and find them to put them on board so we can eat them. <laughs> now, obviously, if you eat a lot of fat, you're going to have liver damage. That's very common, um, especially in those species that really aren't swimming a lot. Um, just if you're eating a lot of fat, you got nowhere to spend it. <laughs> I, I see a lot of fish. I feel like tangs in particular are one species that if I see an obese fish, it's probably a tang, which is impressive because tangs, I feel like, are always swimming. And in some of my other videos, I recommend people to put a powerhead on their tank to give them a little bit of current to swim against. Yeah. <laughs> yes, obviously, obesity can be a problem in pet fish species. And certainly it can is less problematic for active fish. But we've certainly seen it in all different species. Um, I see it the most in koi that are fed diets that are not specific to their water temperature. Um, again, they're eating the pellets. They don't know how much fat's in there. They're just gonna eat it. And unfortunately it just builds up and builds up and builds up. And, and it's just a really gross meat cropsy. So requirements for fat, again, general guidelines. Adults, not that much. Juveniles, lots. And obviously reproductive actively fish, they're going to fall pretty much right in the middle of this, depending if they're egg layers or live bearers. Carbohydrates really aren't utilized efficiently like they are, say, in us and cats and dogs and other animals. So we really don't put them in the diet that much, but a big thing people fix on is fiber. So if a species, a fish species doesn't have that true acidic stomach, it's hard to break down that fiber. Um, you really kind of need to work it and pull it apart to make it useful. So a lot of the times it's just not gonna be helpful for a lot of pet fish species. 
And this always brings us into those lovely shelled green peas that are tuned about all over the place. They have absolutely no more fiber than regular fish food. And obviously your fish can't process it anyway. So why do they work to fix fish with buoyancy disorders? Because we see this all the time. Well, starting off, it's a sinking diet. So fish that are ravenously feeding at the surface, um, depending if they're physostomus or not, might be sucking air into their swim bladder. They might just be puffing up their intestines, do a little fish fart, and they sink down again. Nothing to do with fiber. It also adds <laughs> fresh vitamins. So if you have fish food that is just simply ancient, your fish just needs that little bit of, okay, I ate my broccoli today. Things are starting to move again. That, that's really all it is. And most importantly, it has significantly less protein than a lot of these diets. So less protein, less ammonia output, better water quality makes a lot of things a lot easier. So that's really why those peas work for constipated fish because fish, <laughs> freshwater fish te can't technically be constipated. Yep, I, I recommended peas for people. <laughs> that's okay, I mean, it doesn't hurt. It's certainly a fine, it's a low calorie treat that they can have that's gonna be just fine. Most fish, no problem, shoot it out the other end. Um, but yeah, not gonna hurt them. Moving on to the vitamins and minerals. These are most commonly added as a premix. Now, some companies will put it on the label as premix, and that's perfectly legal. Other people like to pump out their labels and make it as long as possible, so they will list them all by individual scientific name, which, unless you have a dictionary with you, is a little hard to look at sometimes. As far as vitamins go, you have water and fat-soluble vitamins. Um, the water-soluble B and C, so these are the ones that are concerned with lots of different processes, are lost through evaporation. So every time you open that container of fish food, there's gonna be a little bit of moisture loss. And there's really nothing you can do about that except you know replace your food every so often. With minerals, um, this is gonna be listed on the label as ash. Now I've had people tell me that the ash is actually wood pulp that is putting as a filler to fish food, which is 100% not true. It's basically when you burn everything else off, the minerals is what's going to be left. And that's literally the ash that is in the bottom of the cup. Um, most fish actually get their minerals from the water around them. So it's not really a big component of the diet. Um, things like calcium, magnesium, that's going to be more important in water chemistry than anything else. But it, something good to mention, if you're not doing water changes on a regular basis, I know a lot of salt mixes come with a lot of things added to them. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that is where making sure your fish food has all of those minerals in it. If you're not doing water changes all the time, if your salt doesn't have all of that stuff already included, it does play a role. Yes, yeah, certainly doesn't hurt to have a little bit extra. If they don't need it, they can just kind of kick it out the back end. Yep. So just finishing up with some general guidelines. And I love this picture because it's so obviously Photoshopped. Please do your research if possible. Um, yes. See if yes. you can figure out anything about the species, the genus, the family. It might give you a better idea of, you know, at least where that fish falls on the herbivore versus carnivore spectrum. And that'll at least gauge you kind of how much protein you're looking at. Please read your fish food labels. There's a lot of information that seems crazy and just, I, I get it. Those words are big. We got another session. We'll break it all down for you. It takes a lot of time, but it's worth it in the end if you're actually able to break down, you know, this food, maybe not the best choice, but this one's a whole lot better, even if it is cheaper. A lot of fish food price has absolutely no gauge on if a food is good or not. And I'll prove it to you. There's really no one size fits all diet. Everybody wants you know, one food that you feed to all these different varieties of fish and they're all going to be happy. It's just, it doesn't exist. So if you have one species of fish in your tank, like it's a little goldfish tank or a little neon tetra tank there, that's, that's fine. You can have one diet for all those fish, but if you're mixing species, especially again, if they're a slurry of herbivores, carnivores, omnivores, you're going to have to be looking at a couple varied diets. When in doubt, add variety. Again, we don't know a lot for a lot of these species. So, you know, you're trying a little bit of this, a little bit of that, you add some frozen, you add some fresh, you add some dried, probably not the worst idea. Um, obviously there's some things that are just tastier than others that you should probably ration a little bit, like those frozen mysis shrimp. We recommend those for fish that are pretty much near death. 
Um, it's okay, you know, once, twice a week, that's fine. You got a lot of carnivores, but add a little bit of variety, add a little bit of, you know, more herbivore, more omnivore diet, just to kind of give them, you know, cover all your bases essentially. Yep. And again, treats are okay. So these are, you know, little freeze dried shrimp. For some koi and goldfish, it's pieces of fruit. Um, those shell green peas are fine, but again, once or twice a week, max. It's the same as you eating cheeseburgers every day versus, <laughs> you know, one, you know, occasionally, once a week, it's your Friday afternoon cheeseburger. That's fine. Fish do not need those all the time at all. Just because you walk by the tank and then give you sad fish eyes. Yes. <laughs> oh, suffering. goodness. Don't do it. Again, those, those peas that we talked about, that's a good low calorie. They have to have something in their mouths. It's just what you got to do. Um, and one other thing that I unfortunately didn't get on the slide, but if your fish is an omnivore or a carnivore and you yourself are vegan or vegetarian, I'm very sorry. You cannot feed an omnivore or carnivorous fish a vegetarian or vegan diet. I know they're out there. They, they are complete, but they are not good for your fish. Again, if, if you just can't have that relationship where you can't feed them what they need, I highly recommend that you either get a fish that's gonna be able to adhere to your diet guidelines um, or just accept the fact that it's a fish. They need their animal proteins as much as you object to it. They don't make that call. Their genetics are just not set up for it. Our genetics, sure, we can eat vegetarian, we can eat vegan, no problem. But the fish, they need the diet that's specific to their species. So, but then, you know, that's something that I have never thought of. But that's a good point. I'm sure that there are people out there like that, and maybe stick with things. Yeah. I, again, it depends on what species. Again, we we just don't know a lot. But for most of these species, they need what you know is close enough to their wild wild diet even you know their 10th generation off the <laughs> off the reef so yeah i'll be interested to see you know the wild caught versus the captive i'm sure there's a different diet pro profile for them as well that we're hopefully going to be aware of eventually but who knows maybe something to look into so with that there's all of our contact information Do you have any more questions about fish or fish health we're here to help um and yeah with that, Hillary, anything else I can answer about fun fish nutrition basics? <laughs> I think you covered almost everything. And, you know, if you guys are watching this and you have other questions, feel free, please leave a comment. Let us know what you thought of this video. If you've got questions, we'll be happy to try and get them answered. Yes. And um, I'll have your contact information all in the links below. So if you guys want to reach out, follow your page, um, check out the website. There's tons of great information on there. I've been using it for years. I highly recommend it. All righty. Well, thank you so much for joining me. You guys stay tuned. We've got another video coming out. It's going to talk about how to read a fish food label, right? I'm so excited for this one. So make sure you come back and watch that one. Thank you so much for joining me today, Jesse. Oh, thank you. This is great. I love doing it. See you guys later.